Okay, great, thanks. Um, so I'm Tuomas, hi. So the way that we are gonna do this is that um, um, I'm gonna start with a little motivational talk, uh, general uh, background uh, to this topic and, and, and a more general uh, collaboration that we're having with you all. And then I will hand uh, the microphone to him and uh, he will go into the historical details. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start uh, with uh, an apology. Uh, I'm not a historian. Uh, I work in philosophy of mind and philosophy of science. Uh, I am a philosopher. I have a degree in, in philosophy. I've been doing this close to 30 years, so I know about these guys and these names, and I can roughly put them in the right order. Uh, but uh, that's, that's um, pretty much where, where my competence in this history ends. But I have found history uh, very relevant, and I thought it might be useful for you, too, to think about like why we should be doing this and why we should be doing uh, history in general, but uh, history of philosophy in particular. Um, so, so one thing is teaching. Uh, I, I teach philosophy of science, the philosophy of science of research ethics. Uh, most of my students aren't philosophers. Uh, uh, most of my uh, students are actually doing PhD theses on, on, on all, all sorts of weird, weird topics that people do uh, sciences in. Uh, but I do teach undergrads too. And, and, and although some of them do uh, a few other courses in philosophy, most of them, like 80-90% do only this one course in philosophy of science that I teach. So I, had to in, I have to invest quite a lot of energy into trying to explain uh, why this stuff is, is relevant and interesting. Um, and one very useful way of doing this is to focus on, on histor hi historical things. Uh, this is why undergrads in particular easily Remember, if you put things in the historical orders and you have these figures, uh, you have this, the pictures and, 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 and the years and so on, but also that there is a you know, continuity of, of, of these ideas and we kind of a dig into, into the um, uh, uh, history of these, these topics that we are, we are discussing. Um, and I'm, I'm, the other thing that I, uh, I've uh, for a long time already been, been very annoyed that there in a current day philosophical and obviously in scientific discussion in general, uh, the, 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 there's, there's a lack of, lack of historical depth. So you have, even in philosophy, you have these debates that are barely going back to 20 years, let alone a couple of hundred years or, or more. Um, and uh, as my main focus is on causation and causal explanation, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been very, um, uh, in, in that area in particular, I've been annoyed that, uh, that I see these connections, these old connections, and nobody is, 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 is putting these, these pieces together. So that's what I'm trying to do with, with you all, uh, and that's why I'm here today. So focusing very, very much on, on, on causation and, and causal explanation in our talk. Um, so just motivating the, 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 the topic of uh, of uh, the relationship of, of mathematics and, and physics and mathematics and causation and, and mathematical fictions versus reality. i uh, going to introduce a couple of uh, examples from, from current day uh, uh, debates. Here's Max Tegmark's book of mathematica Mathematical Universe. Max Tegmark is a professor of cos cosmology at MIT. And in this book, he defends a very concrete platonistic idea of, of, of physics and reality. So the fundamental uh, uh, reality is, is mathematical. So we have a very old-fashioned philosophical view uh, out there put out by a very prominent uh, physicist. So like these old ideas aren't old ideas. They are very uh, current day things. And then an, an opposite thing, uh, Sabine Hossenfelder, uh, from I think she's in Frankfurt, uh, a physicist, uh, a couple of years ago wrote a book, uh, Lost in Math. So she's kind of a, is a pop uh, figure in, in physics, and, and she's arguing 
that that current day physics has been lost in in in, in, in maths and and we're dealing with these mathematical fictions um so opposite view to, to max tegmark but very closely you know related to 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 many of the things that we have been discussing here today and, and we'll be discussing tomorrow uh, a little bit more about Sabine Hosefer. if you haven't if you're not aware of her stuff I do recommend you you check it oh. out because this is quite interesting uh, um, in relation to to all of these things that we are discussing here um, so she's very known for 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 um, attacking uh, uh, current day physics and, and she's, she's, she's a particle physicist who moved to astrophysics and this is a very recent opinion piece in the Guardian came out last September uh, where she's saying that much of music physics is, is useless and uh, I'm not going to go through these quotes in, in, in this opinion piece she's, she's mainly focusing on kind of sociological points on um, 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 on the fact that the people need to crank out these papers in order to get grants, in order to get tenure, uh, and so on, and, and then this is kind of a feeding into 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 false physics and false fa way of doing physics. Uh, but at the at the kind of a philosophical core of her argument is is that that mathematics uh, physics is, is 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 too mathematical and dealing with these mathematical uh, fictions. Um, and a lot of lot of lot of money is poured poured into this this uh, research. Uh, now, I mean, she's a physicist. She she does you know interact with some philosophers, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure she's quite unaware of these these things that we've been discussing here today. But it's very interesting to me that there is this uh, very. Uh, uh, um, um, concrete, alive debate uh, today among physicists how we should, do be, we should be doing physics and, and uh, what is the role of mathematical fictions in, in physics. And, and, and there was a uh, uh, chain of, of replies in The Guardian and then these are not just some random readers, these are, these are uh, physicists, professional physicists uh, uh, replying to to, to her opinion piece. Uh, <coughs> again, if you haven't read these, I recommend you check these out. They are short pieces and it's very, very interesting with regard to, to, the <coughs> to the topic of this workshop. So <coughs> a number of people in, in these replies make the point that, that, um, that this is what physics has historically been that we create these mathematical fictions and then we start making them more concrete or more real and we start testing them and so on. So there's nothing wrong with, with modern day physics. This isn't anything special that we're doing nowadays. Uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't think that any of these people are really aware of all this, this historical stuff and I'm hoping that we can start making this more relevant and having some sort of a interaction. So I mean, there's a, there's a long history to this, um, and this is this is the some uh, some examples that I, I quickly like came up with the uh, uh, about the, uh, the kind of um, claim that that, that 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 you know we have these mathematical fictions and they they shouldn't have role in, in, in physics. Uh, Newton, I mean, that's uh, clear in, in this context that we are discussing here, uh, and I wonder uh, whether there was a you know, this controversy already before Newton, so that's why I have the ancient medieval times and I would be glad to hear if, if, you, <coughs> if you can kind of uh, come up with good examples uh, before Newton or, or what, what was the history, because obviously he didn't come up out of, out of um, nothing. Um, Boltzmann, um, he was advised uh, when he was uh, trying to publish in a, in a in a, in a high quality physics journal, uh, not to mention at atoms and, and molecules because these are fictions that they don't make sense and so on. So <laughs> you can write and then try and publish but don't mention these things because they don't make sense. And this, you think about this for a while because this is what everybody's doing now, atoms and molecules. If you go there, 
in the biology, physics, chemistry, whatever department and ask what's really real. It's atoms and molecules. Molecular biology, that's, that's what everybody's doing. And, uh, but the guy who kind of came up with this was like, no, these are mathematical fictions, so you should have mentioned this. Uh, Max Planck was working with entropy when he was trying to get the tenure. Um, yeah, when I started mentioning entropy, uh, but this wasn't quite fashionable since it was regarded as a mathematical spook. Again, don't, don't use this term, this is just a mathematical fiction. Uh, obviously now entropy is everywhere. We have different kinds of notions of entropy uh, uh, out there, uh, not just in physics, but information theory and, and so on. Uh, Einstein is interesting because uh, this argument was placed paid against him, but then he also played that, this kind of similar argument uh, with regard to quantum physics. So 90 years ago when, when uh, um, uh, when um, Jewish um, scientists were, were uh, uh, kind of a expelled from the scientific community over here, uh, and there was the notion of, of Jewish physics, uh, one of the arguments against Einstein was back in the day that, that, that his theories are mathematical fictions, they are not real physics. Now obviously these were politically driven and, and, and racist arguments, but, but it's interesting to me that, that you could pull this, this point out of the shelf and apply this in this case. And then um, uh, only a little later, Einstein himself obviously uh, criticized quantum physics, uh, saying that, that uh, uh, it's, uh, it will lead into, into spooky action at the distance, it's not, not real and doesn't make sense and so on. Um, and there are other, other, other examples and and, and uh, my point is that we have this, this mathemal, mathematical fictions versus uh, real, concrete, causal understanding of the world, and there is this tension happening uh, uh, constantly. So ma mathematics and, and its, it's, it's causal, causal application, uh, that's the, um, that's the, um, there's kind of a tension, the, the problem here that we want to address and, 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 and is at the core of, of, of what people with Du Châtelet and, and Wolf and, and, and others were, were um, uh, addressing uh, uh, with regard to Newton in particular, obviously. And um, yeah, I think this is a, this bit is uh, pretty much directly from, from Aaron's paper. Uh, so, um, and the basic issue is that um, Wolf, but other people too, are uh, being uh, pessimistic about the role of mathematics and causal explanation, stressing the explanation ought to track how things are in themselves at the level of fundamental, simple substances. So there's fundamental stuff that, that is, is, is causal, and then we, uh, then we have these abstractions that are uh, fictions or not as real. Uh, what, what bothers me about well, a lot of this discussion is that it seems to take this notion of causation for granted or, or primitive uh, and uh, much of my own work has been uh, has been trying to, to uh, make clear what, what the notion of causation is and this is what people in, in philosophy of science in the past 20-30 uh, years have been uh, doing doing a lot. So um, in, in the current day discussion, I find useful to, to, to talk about uh, causation uh, in relation to, to this, this particular uh, paper that, that makes the point that we have these two, uh, if not two notions or accounts of causation, two intuitions, two, two two ideas that we apply to, to uh, causation. Uh, so on the one hand, we have this very concrete causation as a production or generative power uh, idea. And in many of these papers, uh, people use the term of causal power. Uh, so this is a list which I like to 
claim is pretty comprehensive list of, of kind of a current day theories of causation that fall in this camp. Uh, and actually the previous talk was pretty good in, in highlighting this continuity idea. That there's something continues from the cause to the eff effect. Uh, so there's a, there's a transference of something, uh, a mark, energy or, or force. Uh, and I think the most uh, uh, precisely formulated idea in this camp is the conserved quantity uh, theory of causation uh, that Phil Dow and uh, Wesley Salmon, uh, well, was developed in the 90s. Uh, and this is very much when people want to refer to this view of looking at causation. And that, that's, that's the, uh, these are the names that people are, are referring to. But then there's the causation as a variable dependency or, or, or manipulation. So there's, there's no, uh, uh, at least there's no kind of a spatial temporal continuity. Also negative things, negative uh, events, omissions can be causes and effects uh, according to this view. Uh, again, uh, I'd like to claim that this is, this is quite a comprehensive list of, of uh, theories that, that are around nowadays. Especially the manipulationist interventionist uh, theory in, in philosophy, also counterfactual theory, and these are obviously connected. Uh, but then also the structural equation and causal modeling stuff, which is just people uh, in, in a variety of sciences are very much, much doing. Uh, so kind of two different ways of looking at causation, and uh, I think uh, these are, um, um, yeah. I mean, I, I see when I when I hear these these talks and discussions, I, I I I'm I'm trying to put these into kind of these things that people say in these two different categories, and, and also trying to trying to uh, uh, kind of a, uh, form a, a some sort of a consistent one view. Um, another distinction that is. Uh, very uh, uh, much alive today in, in in philosophy is the Aristotelian versus Humean way of looking at looking at the world. Uh, so, uh, so the idea that we have some sort of causal powers out there uh, versus the idea that that there is no causation out there. It's just like a statistic set of space time points, and then then. Uh, Wars of nature aren't something that drive things out there, but they're just best system, systematic systematizations of these yeah, um, uh, space time points. Um, and uh, when I find out, what I find interesting about this, these two camps is that this, is, this, this divide is very sharp. It's like conservative and liberal you know, thinking that you have to choose your camp and then you don't talk to the other camp and it kind of uh, dictates what you read and who you, who you talk to and where you go and so on. Um, but I'm not sure where this, where this uh, distinction really uh, arose. Uh, um, so, I mean, again, one, one thing that uh, I would like to hear more about if you, if you have uh, um, uh, some uh, information about the historical, historical roots of this, this distinction. Uh, so, um, one thing about um, uh, to Chatelet and and and, uh, and these things that were discussed uh, during her time is is um, that I'm you know, connecting it to this this modern idea of hier hierarchical levels of reality. And I started to wonder when, when did we get this idea? Uh, because, um, so, so there seems to be this idea of, of a, uh, a fundamental simple substances. They are the fundamental, fundamental things and then you have bodies and then you have mathematical abstractions and, and that these are all real. But there is distinction between fundamental reality and what I call here derived reality. So obviously 
there's some reason to hold something fundamental. Uh, something is really real and then something is maybe a bit less real. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, in, 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 in the way, you know, I see it, uh, Du Chatelet seems to think that, uh, that we have this, although we just now learned that maybe she didn't, it's, it's not clear what, the, what sort of causation uh, these, these, these simple, simple um, substances are, uh, are dealing with, but there is this idea that they are the, fundal, they are the fundal, fundamental causal things, and, and then we get into bodies, and then we get to mathematic, mathematical abstractions. When I look at the modern discussion, in, in philosophy of science, which is you know very big discussion on how how do we put uh, mathematical physics and causation together, it seems to go the other way around. So uh, that there are these fundamental mathematical things out there. They are not causal; they are functional relationships or symmetries or whatever. But then we need to somehow get causa causation out to to arise from that. Uh, um, so this is an interesting, uh, like what, what exactly is going on in here? Uh, and like I said, uh, one thing that has happened in between, I think, is, is this, this hierarchical, it wasn't maybe that clear uh, in the last time, uh, um, that, that now we have these levels of reality thing, that there's this more fundamental, uh, smaller, uh, and also more more mathematical things, and then then this uh, other stuff rises from it somehow. Um, so this is my last slide, and I'm motivating uh, yours, bit. Uh, so we've been um, talking about the equality principle. This is this is our term for for the idea that the cause and effect are are equal, uh, and kind of putting out a bold hypothesis in there that this this is a this is a fundamental uh, connecting uh, principle, and uh, we've been discussing this a lot. And I've kind of a uh, at least at, at this moment, I think that. This is a more general principle. It's not not just a causal principle. We can give it a, a causal reading. Uh, we can give it a mathematical reading, and we should maybe think about it more as an idea of compactness or or a parsimony or some some kind of effective way of controlling and manipulating the world. Uh, uh, I mean, the intuitive idea is that obviously the most compact relationship or connection between two different things is equality. And, and that can be mathematical or, or causal and so on. Um, what is interesting is that I find this, this, this principle doing causal work in this current day causal debates in related to causal explanation. Uh, let me just mention one example. So we have the conserved quantity account, account of causation uh, and uh, what is interesting is that the, the, the uh, uh, conservation of energy, uh, uh, Julius von Meyer uh, uh, you know, came up with this argument and he derives it explicitly from the causa effectum principle. But none of these people who talk about this causal, uh, this uh, conserved quantity idea, this idea that there is energy or something else uh, conserved in, in causal processes, uh, they seem to be completely oblivious of, of this, this, this historical uh, uh, connection. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the, the, I, I do think that this principle uh, does a lot of work in, in, in current day uh, causal reasoning. Uh, but obviously, there's also this historical development from uh, this is an important principle for Leibniz, but but it's in Wolf in to Chatelet and Kant, and and over to um, Julius von Meyer, who then formulates the uh, the uh, uh, um, 
principle of conservation of energy. And of course, then this gets re reduced into a mathematical, so that kind of loses this cause of reading. Uh, but what I'm interested in historically is mapping this, like what happens, how, how this transition from this causal idea uh, into this mathematical uh, idea, uh, actually, because this principle kind of uh, disappears in, in uh, uh, say, a bit less 200 years ago or something. But you know, now you are going to focus on the uh, on this principle and, and uh, do Chatelet and Kant. All right. So. So I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about, um, uh, about the equality principle. Um, and the reason why we're talking about the equality principle, especially when it comes to in, in connection to Du Chatelet, is because uh, of her focus on the question of causation. Right? I, I know, that of course, that uh, it's come up now whether or not um, she thought that uh, simple substances had causal relations to one another. But I think one of the things we can point out is that um, she stands out in the sense that um, she's between Kant and Leibniz, right? I know for sure that Leibniz would have thought that, look, there aren't uh, going to be any causal relationships between, uh, between simple substances, right? Um, and, and what we have, what seems like causation, is rather just uh, you know, pre-established harmony. And then when you get to Kant, right, there's this problem of trying to solve the issue uh, that's brought up by, of course, Hume. You know, on the one hand, Hume, and on the other, you know, you've got uh, you've got a Leibniz, right, and the attempts to to reconcile um, these two. That the question that uh, that as uh, Thomas brought up is that how then do you justify uh, mathematical physics, right? Um, not justify mathematical physics in the sense that um, hey, how can I attach numbers to to measures and so forth, right, and do some sort of calculation on things, but rather whether or not you're getting at the things in them in themselves, right? That is, what is physics supposed to do for us, right? Is it just supposed to be method, or is it supposed to somehow um, get to the nature of things in themselves, right? And Du Chatelet, I think um, it's pretty clear that she takes this rather seriously, perhaps more seriously than than um, than um, than others before her, right, or even after. Insofar as she attempts to deal with um, this idea of what mathematical objects are doing, okay, and without mathematical objects, you don't have. Um, mathematical physics, right? And I think she's uh, doing, dealing with it a little bit better than even Newton, right? Because Newton says, of course, uh, I don't feign hypotheses, right? And then you might think, okay, well, Newton is not then worried about the metaphysics. But then, of course, in his spare time, he's busy trying to figure out what actually is the, uh, the purpose, what actually is the cause of, um, of uh, universal gravitation. Uh, so, so let's start out by a little bit about um, you know contemporary physics. It's so closely aligned with uh, with mathematical expression that uh, we do rightfully call it like mathematical physics, right? Uh, it seems natural then to suppose that you know mathematics is indispensable to physical theory and even necessary um, to obtain knowledge of physical phenomena. And here we can read we can read physics you know uh, more broadly, right? And it's not just material. Of course, we're talking about, you know, um, you know, fields and, and the like, right? Um, so, but this has always been the case in the history of philosophy, uh, even though the relationship between physics and mathematics has always, of course, been a um, subject of debate since ancient times. It did intensify in the 17th and 18th centuries during the development of what we would now consider uh, contemporary mathematical physics. And it's especially important in the 17th and 18th centuries is because this is where this notion of symmetry um, starts to arise, even though it's not um, explicitly mentioned. Um, but of course, in the, uh, in the work of, um, of Noter, right, um, we do have this, this uh, connection between um, mathematical symmetries. Of course, after um, you know, algebra develop, has developed uh, sufficiently well to describe that, well, at least rather group theory. Um, but what we want to say is that the, the symmetry considerations were there even in the history of philosophy, and they're connected to um, the development of mathematical physics um, via uh, through the, uh, the, the cause equals, or rather, um, 
cause equals effect, you know, the equality principle. Oh. All right, so, so there were rather two, two camps, um, say, before for this, right? Um, so in the first camp, physics should be expressed in qualitative terms since the quantitative nature of mathematics could not uh, express real causes, okay? Uh, and again, causes there becomes, um, like becomes the, the issue. Even, until, even up until the uh, early part of the 20th century, um, there were many physicists that thought insofar as we're doing physics, right, um, or we're discovering like laws of nature, um, we have to somehow be talking about causes, right? So uh, Niels Bohr, for instance, thought this. Uh, and that physical phenomena uh, were too imprecise to be accurately represented in mathematical formulae. Okay. So now, of course, one might say to camp one is that, oh, but that's just because our mathematics wasn't good enough, right? So we had the discussion earlier uh, about the concept of uh, the, the development of um, you know, the mathematical concept of continuity, right? Um, and, and, um, and the work that that was done there to define the idea of a limit, I suppose, right? Um, but it can, it gets even, you know, more thorny, um, thornier that the problem is as we get to, um, say, people like Mach and Holder, um, where the question, the, the issue of um, whether or not, you know, we can have a kind of mathematical physics um, becomes a question of how it is that we can um, really arrange knowledge uh, about the world, uh, how we can have some sort of deductive um, uh, deductive physics, right? Um, the deduction from the mathematical part and the physics part, you know, from uh, the fact we're talking about real things. But before that, camp two, um, the divide between mathematics and physics, you know, people say it was an invidious one, and that mathematics was necessary to obtain physical knowledge. So, for instance, the division between mathematics and what we, what were then called uh, mixed sciences, harmonics, astronomy, uh, mechanics, optics, etc. So John Wallace, for instance, um, argued that there's no other way to determine the physical laws of, of motion exactly but by applying the mathematics measures and proportions to them. Okay. All right. Now, I suppose I should have gotten rid of the, the the Leibniz and Newton there, right? But I think it's, most people are clear that, that if anybody would have thought that, uh, that look, we have to use mathematics um, to get at the nature of things, um, would have been a Leibniz, right? Who thought that, um, that there, are, there are things that uh, can't be imagined but can only be understood, and that's one of the purposes of, of uh, mathematical reasoning. Newton um, would not have, of course, objected to um, you know, to, to mathematical physics, right? Much of his uh, work, as was mentioned in the first talk, um, was, uh, was a kind of continuation of, uh, well, an application of, um, of Euclid's, say, elements, right? Um, it was really a work in geometry. And as was mentioned also later on, Euler sort of takes that and, and uh, makes Newton's mechanics more, say, mathematical, right, or, or analytic. Wolf and Du Chatelet, once we get to them, Wolf, interestingly, um, is pessimistic about the role of mathematics in, in causal explanation. Okay, um, so I'll just quote uh, what Aaron writes here. He says, well, he says, praise for mathematical method and the precision of mathematical concepts, however, has historically been quite compatible with doubts about causal applications of mathematics. Uh, Wolf fits this pattern. He's pessimistic about the role of mathematics in causal explanation, stressing that explanations ought to track how things are in themselves at the level of fundamental substances. These substances are not extended. We do not observe them directly, but their causal features can be partly deduced through metaphysical argument. Insofar as mathematical concepts depend on our imagination, however, they do not track properties of fundamental simple substances or mind-independent causal uh, relations generally. So Wolf thinks it also follows from these considerations that mathematical objects are at best merely possible entities as such mathematical prop propositions are hypotheses that do not prove that their objects are actually instantiated. So it's in light of this that, um, 
and de Chatelet is, is, is working, right? So she wants to say that, look, we need mathematical, um, we, we need the application of mathematics and physics, um, without saying that there's no, that it has no connection to things in themselves. Okay, so now this might seem like a weird jump, okay? Jumping all the way to Chatelet on the PSR. Um, and the reason I've done this is because we believe that there is, Tomas and I think that there are many instances in which, um, you know, a thinker will be using the, the PSR, but in a way where you might think, okay, well, this is uh, maybe an instance of the, um, the principle of cause equals of uh, cause equals effect. Uh, and so um, that's, that's why we've, that's why I put it up here, right? Because I want to say that there's, there's, a, there's an interesting connection between these two. Um, one isn't just a corollary of the other. We actually think that, um, that the principle of quality, the, the, the quality of cause and effect is an application of the PSR. And we'll see why. So, of course, she writes, um, that uh, with the help of reason, he, Leibniz, has provided a compass capable of guiding us in the moving sands of this science, metaphysics. And she also connects it, of course, to contingent truths, as Leibniz does. Um, her two main principles, also like Leibniz and Wolf, um, principle of contradiction and principle of sufficient reason. So, Fritz and the institutions. Thus, for example, I can be sitting lying down or standing and these determinations of my situation are equally possible. When, but when I'm standing, there must be a sufficient reason why I'm standing and not lying, uh, not sitting or lying down. Okay. For the source, the majority of false reasoning is forgetting sufficient reason and you will soon see that this principle is the only thread that could guide us in these labyrinths of error. The human mind has built for itself in order to have the pleasure of going astray, so we should accept nothing that violates this fundamental axiom, it keeps a tight rein on the imagination, which often falls to error as soon as it's not restrained by the rules of strict reason. Okay. All right. Now, I um, think that uh, it's, uh, she also speaks about the equality of cause and effect, and you can see the connection here. In reference to Kepler, for instance, that uh, Kepler expressed this you know, resistant force in a significant way by the words vis, um, vis inertia. Without this force, none of the laws of motion could subsist, and all motions would be without sufficient reason. For were we to admit that matter was without resistance or force of inertia, there would be no proportion between cause and effect. Okay. The argument here, it seems to me, is that without accepting inertial force, uh, motions would be without sufficient reason, so we'd have a violation of, um, of the principle of sufficient reason. But the reason she points for this is that the proportion between cause and effect would be violated. And um, so it seems to me that we can conclude that for de Chatelet, the equality principle is, a sort of is an application of the, of the PSR um, because the, the lack of proportion between cause and effect is what um, is what would cause motions to occur without sufficient reason. So you'd have motions um, sort of occurring without reason at all. And this is, you know, reminiscent of, uh, oh, okay, that should be, that's in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, echoes of, of Leibniz, um, it seems to me. So Leibniz in, um, in his derivation of, um, of vis viva, um, the first sort of conservation law, at least in a, in a modern expression, he writes that, but lest anyone suspect that this is only a verbal dispute, uh, his dispute with the Cartesians, or that we are arguing about the various meanings of power, you must understand that what we seek is, for example, the velocity that a previously resting body, one pound in, in weight, say, must acquire and the total power or action contained in a four pound body. Right, so I'll just go down to the end there, um, where he writes, my view is that it can only receive two degrees. They settle the matter in a way so as to conserve the same quantity of motion, which they confuse with power. Uh, and here's the important part. I do so in order to conserve the same quantity of power, that is to preserve the equality of cause and effect. So um, conserving the same quantity of power is to him 
preserving um, the equality of cause and effect. And he says, and to prevent perpetual motion for arising um, by one exceeding to the other. So either cause or effect exceed, exceeding the other is, for him, uh, what brings about perpetual motion, right? And perpetual motion here, we're to understand it as, um, you know, there being an effect without there some cause that's attached to, right? So something uh, arising without reason, right? So uh, if not, uh, if not a quality between um, the PSR and principle of uh, uh, equality of cause and effect, then certainly one is an application of the other. Well, the, the equality principle is an application of the PSR. I won't read the whole bit here, but um, here's uh, even uh, another instance which Du Chatelet is talking about, the resistance of bodies, and, um, and then there's a sustained discussion about, um, about the equality of, of forces, and where she makes this distinction between how there can be, there might be differences in, in forces of ones like pulling a, a rope, but there'll always be an equality between action and, and uh, reaction there. Right? So, um, and you can find that in uh, institutions three, Section 259, 260. All right. Um, so towards the end, she says, so precisely speaking, all the force of matter, be it at rest or moving, be it communicating motion or receiving it, all its actions and its action, all its impulses and resistance are nothing other than this, you know, this inertia in different circumstances. So the argument here um, is that we can, is that the, uh, the PSR or the, the uh, forces quality of cause and effect um, is, is maintained by us um, you know, positing um, sort of a, a dead, dead force or vis inertia. Right. All right, so one of the, uh, what, what we think of about the centrality of the, of the equality principle um, and we say that it goes back further, is that we think that the equality principle um, is in fact what gets us to connect, um, uh, to connect uh, discussion of the physical world um, with mathematics. Uh, and this is something that Leibniz thought as well in his com comments on, uh, on Archimedes' work. He felt that, uh, he said Archimedes could only move, uh, could only make the, like in his proof of the, um, oh, actually, Ah, so this is where, ah, this is where that belongs, okay. <laughs> so, um, Imes writes in his second letter to Clark, and therefore Archimedes, being desirous to proceed from mathematics to natural philosophy, in his book, you know, on equilibrium, um, was obliged to make use of a particular case of the great principle of sufficient reason. He takes it for granted that if there's a balance in which everything is alike on both sides, and if equal weights are hung on the two ends of that balance, the whole will be at rest. Uh, that is, because no reason can be given why one side should weigh down rather than the other. So he's taking here the, um, the law of the lever, uh, at least Archimedes' derivation of it, uh, as an application of the principle of sufficient reason. Um, and this is important because others have noticed it as, um, as an application of the, of the equality principle, the equality of cause and effect. Uh, and the law of the lever is, it's interesting because you can, um, um, because you can also see it as a, as a, um, as a special instance of the, uh, of the conservation of angular momentum. And so you can see it as a conservation law, right? Uh, and, and the argumentation for that is, it seems to be very close to, um, to the argumentation that Leibniz gives for, uh, for vis viva. And so they both use the equality principle. Um, and as uh, Tomas mentioned, is also what we see later on in, the, um, in Meyer's derivation um, of the conservation law. All right. So,
So it's the first explicit use of equilibrium principle in the history of physical inquiry. Um, however, it's often not, it often goes unnoticed that LL's importance is the first, you know, was the use of the equality of cause and effect. Okay. And okay, so all right, yeah, okay, let's skip that. We're probably not doing very well on time, are we? No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, all right, so let's. All right. All right. Uh, so. When it comes to the question of fundamentality um, versus uh, reality here, right? Um, as Tomas pointed out, uh, we see in, Duch in Duchatelet in, in her willingness to, to deal with the question of, um, you know, of causation or the question of uh, the application of, of, uh, of mathematical physics. Um, even though she's influenced, heavily influenced by Wolf, uh, and also held that the fundamental constituents of reality are non-spatial temporal simple, simple substances. The mathematical objects uh, employed in, in mathematical physics are imaginary, right? But, the, but just, because they're not, just because they're abstract, I should use that term, um, doesn't mean they don't have application to the, um, to the real world. And that's what um, she's interested in. So the difference that while Wolf held that since we do not observe simple substances directly, their causal features are deducible only through metaphysical reasoning, not mathematical reasoning, because mathematical concepts depend on imagination. And she argues, of course, that imaginary status mathematical objects, um, they're in fact indispensable in physics. Mathematical objects used in mathematical physics can aid us in correct reasoning without tracking simple substances. Okay, so they don't have to track simple substances in order to, to aid us in, um, in reasoning about reality. Uh, and um, we think, of course, that this is because she's really correcting and saying that, uh, um, that look, there are fundamental substances and then there are you know, derived substances. Both are real. Okay, so the empirical realm um, can be dealing with real things. It doesn't have to be dealing with empirical things. So if our... Uh, it doesn't have to be dealing with fundamental things, at least in terms of uh, directly. Okay. So that way she can maintain um, both her commitment to fundamental non-spatial temporal substances and her commitment to the utility of mathematical physics. Right? Um, and this is something that, uh, that we think that Kant can't do. Right? So question might arise. Um, how does this kind of reasoning lead to empirically accurate predictions if this mathematical reasoning doesn't track the simple substances they're supposed to be about, right, under this conception of what <coughs> physics is supposed to do for us? All right. Um, so we say that there's, because there seems to be this uh, in Duchatelet, this distinction between fundamental reality and derived reality, fundamentality and, and derived reality. Um, so it's between um, so mathematical objects have derived reality, although they're neither fundamental nor are they abstractions from fundamental substances, uh, but rather from bodies. As such, they have empirical utility um, in physical theory and, give us, and can give us ever more accurate predictions about the real world, um, both, and this can come in two ways, uh, with the better, mathematical, better the mathematical methods, as well as the, uh, the, the better measurements of the real world we have, the more... Um, the more the more qualities of physical objects we can abstract from, right? So our models can become can become richer, uh, and as our methods, and I think this this is a distinction that has to be made: the mathematical method as opposed to the mathematical objects. Um, so that's right, and the <laughs> sorry, this is all, but I'll, I'll just mention this. And the the last bit here um, is. This regulative versus constitutive use of the PSR, because somebody might say, "Well, wait, um, Kant also has the PSR as well, right?" And um, surely Kant also mentions um, and uses the equality principle. Um, who doesn't? Um, so Kant does, to be sure, mentions the equality um, principle. He uses it, uh, and so does Du Chatelet, right? But um, 
Kant, of course, makes this distinction between the pneumo realm and, and, uh, and the realm of appearance. And so the thought's going to be, what, what distinction is being, uh, is being pointed out here? And I think that the distinction we're making is to say that, well, Kant also you know, makes this distinction in the use of the PSR by saying that we've got the regulative use and the constitutive use. So where he'll say that uh, like a Leibniz or a Duchatelet um, will use the constitutive use, will employ the constitutive use of the PSR, whereas he thinks we ought to only use the regulative use of the PSR. And it's that broad distinction that then makes it so that um, his discussion of the quality principle, his use of it, is just going to be within um, the realm of experience and doesn't have to have any connection to things in themselves. So you get a, a radically different conception of, of what, well, maybe not radically, but a, a different conception of what physics is supposed to be doing for us and, and what its utility is, and that some people have called, you know, a kind of sort of Kantian humility. Um, whereas, um, you know, Duchatelet and Leibniz, et cetera, wouldn't be so humble in so far as they think that physics can get us to the nature of things in themselves. All right, so that's what we think is the distinction, but um, I've gone far enough. I, I hope uh, we get some more edifying questions. Thank you.